This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 61. Welcome to the 61st episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from FertilityFriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. If you've been enjoying the show, I would love it if you take a moment and leave a review and a rating on iTunes. It helps the show to move up in rankings so that more people can find it. And of course, I'd like to say a special thank you to all the listeners who have left reviews already. I do read all of your reviews, and I so appreciate you taking the time to let me know how I'm doing. And you'll find today's episode and the show notes for everything that we talk about at fertilityfriday.com slash podcast. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash fertility Fridays with an S and on Twitter at Fertile Friday. And if you're wanting to learn more about the fertility awareness method, I have started the Fertility Friday Facebook group. So just head over to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll be redirected to the group. And Another note, in 2016, I'm actually opening up my schedule to see clients. I'm so excited to be offering fertility awareness support and education. And so I do have a limited number of spaces available, and I've developed a program to teach an introductory session, so kind of more at the beginner level. Shoot me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com, and we'll set up a free 15-minute consultation to figure out if we're a good fit to work together. And in today's show, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Willow Buckley. Willow is a certified classical homeopath, labor doula, and prenatal yoga teacher. She has a Bachelor of Science in Neuropsychology, and she combined her holistic interests with her medical studies, ventured into homeopathy. For the last eight years, she's helped families and individuals of all ages handle everything from anxiety and depression to morning sickness and sore throats. She is a huge proponent of the body's power to heal itself and infuses nutrition with real food into her practice. And when she became pregnant herself, her focus shifted, leading her down her current path as a prenatal birth and postpartum guide and co-author of the recently published book, How to Conceive Naturally and Have a Healthy Pregnancy After 30, which I'm super excited to talk about. And in today's show, we'll be talking about how to prepare for pregnancy before you start trying to conceive and why it's important to do so. We'll also be talking about what women need to know about having babies after age 30. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Willow. Thank you. Oh, I'm so excited that, to have you here today. And before we get into it, I would just, I did give you a bit of an introduction, but I'd love to hear just a little bit about what inspired you to, you and Krista Arecchio, to write this book together and kind of just talk a little bit about your journey into holistic health. Sure. Um, well, First, I'll talk about the book because that's definitely more exciting. <laughs> it's, um, my husband and I were kind of just creating our own preconception preparation about 10 months out. And when we started, I went to Krista, my guru for all things um, nutrition. And I started asking her, you know, I'm pulling from this blog. I love this book. I do this. Like, where's the all in one? Where is it that really lays out? what to do beforehand and what to do throughout pregnancy. Um, I, it was hard piecemealing everything. And she's like, I don't know, let's just write it. And I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she is a really um, powerful superwoman when it comes to, like, conviction and getting things going. And, and we got it going. And four years later, we have this amazing book that we really had no idea what it was going to turn into. I but we knew that. the mission was there and it needed to to get into people's hands. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. I love that like, oh, you know, I'm looking for this information and she's just like, let's do it. Oh, yeah. It, that's one of the things I love about her, right? She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm dying to get into the book because um, but as, as I mentioned before we started recording, I delved into it to prepare for our podcast. And I just found it to be such a, an amazing comprehensive guide for women. So maybe just to get us get our feet wet, maybe you could talk a little bit about what your intentions were when you wrote the book and how it's different from a lot of the other resources that are out there. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So with this book, our real intention was that preparing the body for pregnancy should be a, a no-brainer almost. You know, that should be something that everyone considers just as important as what they do when they find out they get pregnant. Um, because the body and what it can do beforehand as it's actually 
preparing those eggs and preparing the sperm many days, weeks, months even before a, t- a period of conception um, really can make and break the health of that future baby for chronic disease, for so many things. We'll go into that later. But we wanted um, to inspire women that, you know, we don't have a lot of control over things in pregnancy or in parenting. But what we do have is the um, empowerment to take charge of our bodies and prepare for this journey, which can be, you know, um, beautiful. It doesn't have to be with uh, with stress and strife and too many physical um uncomfortable symptoms as we call them, which they're going to happen anyway often, but it's, um, we just wanted to empower women and their, their spouses or partners or whomever they're going to conceive with that it really is going to be life changing for the future generation. And it's going to make their pregnancy um, more vibrant and their postpartum period much easier if they're nice and balanced hormonally, um, and have these tools. Mm hmm. Well, you know, one of my favorite topics that I talk about a lot on the podcast is the importance of preconception care, because like you said, it should be a no brainer that women think about, uh, take the time to really think about how to prepare their bodies for pregnancy, but it's just not, we're just not there. (laughs) No, no, we, we, that's why we lay it out is we call it our five trimester approach. So the first trimester is that preconception period. It's the minimum three months before one even plans to conceive, not whether they actually conceive or not. And then you have the first, second, and third trimester of pregnancy, which are actually our second, third, and fourth. And then the postpartum period is our fifth trimester because there's so many things changing in the body with this new baby at home. And you still need to be taking care of that body to um, really create that vibrant health. Well, and what I love, a huge part of of what you talk about in the book is nutrition and Mm. nutrition um, obviously that's not the only factor, but it's a huge factor, but huge. nutrition from, like you said, before we get pregnant throughout and after, which I think is really important. And so I guess to get into it, why is it important for women to, to have this mindset or to, to, you know, when, when they can, obviously some people fall pregnant and that's, it just happens. But when, when we can plan ahead, why is that important and what difference does it make? Yeah. One thing about that. Yes. Sometimes we can't plan in advance because that soul is ready to come in and bless the women and the souls that come in without all that planning. You just do what you do when you know what you know. So you just start from the time you figure out you're pregnant or you start from the time you're deciding to plan to get pregnant. Um, And if you are planning, why food and nutrition is so important is because it is what makes us. We are what we eat, literally. The biochemistry that comes from all these nutrients from our food creates us. It feeds our cells. And so to really create anything else that is not going to be real food or that's going to be serving us is literally making us sick. And if we can override that in that preconception phase, We are going to prepare a better quality of our egg, a better quality of sperm. When you combine those, then you're taking care of yourself and you're actually reducing the possibility for chronic disease in that child's adulthood. The risks are being decreased. Yeah. And one of the things that is just, it's mind blowing is the the concept of epigenetics. So I did not get my bachelor of science in neuroscience. (laughs) Put that out there. It sounds way more fancy always. So. Of course. <laughs> but how does what I like, how does what a person eat? So as a mom, how does what I eat before I even get pregnant have an impact on my grandkids? Sure. It, it's a pretty wild thing. It's the science of epigenetics has been around for a while, but it's really emerging and becoming more common with the more and more studies that are happening. So depending on what a woman eats and their partner beforehand, has the ability to change these switches in our um, genes. So once thought that we have certain genes and genes carry certain dispositions to hereditary diseases, etc. Um, they thought these switches, it was like you either, it was on or it was off and there was no way to change it. But food and the way we treat ourselves nutritionally actually can change those switches to on or off. So now we have the ability to alter 
how our body and those chromosomes that we pass on to our kids preconception and during pregnancy to turn those genes on and off and it'll read them differently. So how often are you hearing, oh, must have those that bad heart from your side of the family or oh, probably gets that from your side of the family. We don't have to say that anymore. We really don't. We can really take the reins and we can start preemptively changing that risk factor for our children. So I love that concept because I think that I think that so just so that the audience and myself are kind of clear on the concept of epigenetics. So we're all kind of told that we have genes that give us these features or these traits or these risk factors for certain illnesses. Correct. And then with the concept of epigenetics, it's kind of like the environment can have an impact on the expression of these genes. Is that how this works? Correct. So how the body um, within the chromosomes, um, as they get passed on, it's how the body reads these genes. So if they were always on or always off, now they can read them differently and they don't have to um, be beholden to this hereditary disposition. Environment can change. You know, there's lots of different things. It's not just um, nutrition, but that's a huge point. They've done studies where they show um, diabetes. They've shown um, a bunch of different other diseases where it's no, they're just gone. It's not hereditarily um, a disposition in that offspring. And I think that concept is so freeing because so if you have a certain illness in your family, diabetes is a good example or whatever it is that a lot of people in your family have suffered for, you know that although you may have these genes, there's so much you can do so that you can turn them off, which is yeah. <laughs> which is so exciting. And then what we're eating and the way we're living our lives and so many different factors, it's so important to know that those choices and decisions make a difference for our children and their children. It's crazy. Even their children. That is wild. I mean, I understood a single generation, but when you were really laying it out for that many generations ahead for grandchildren, it makes sense once you see, if you change one, then they are going to be able to change the next. Um, it's, it's, it's very empowering. And I, and I think it should be well known. (laughs) Do you have an example so that to make it more tangible, something that that goes down through the, the generations? I'm not sure if you do or not, but if you sure. do. Sure. Diabetes is actually one of the main um, things that they've done. So when they they fed um, – now, this was done, of course, in a lab because that's where most studies are done, if you'll um, look at all of the the research. But it was with um, – with rats where they induced diabetes and they get, they all had diabetic, they were diabetic and they changed the feed in the offspring. And that following generation after they changed what they fed them in the second offspring that had it, they, it was clear they did not have it. The ones who were fed nutritionally clean okay, versus, um, high sugar, bad diet, et cetera. Now that's like a a very simplistic way of looking at it. And then in a broader scheme, they can see the disposition um, reduced in humans for that same thing for diabetics when they see moms um, who have a cleaner diet throughout pregnancy, not just preconception. So even if you don't get that preconception phase in, it's also what you do throughout pregnancy that can change and help that risk factor for the children. Okay. And so they've they've seen it. I might have it. I don't have the – I'm looking in the book right now just to see if I could grab the statistic. So I'll keep looking and I'll grab that for you. Okay. Well, yeah, no, that's just – it's such a – I like I said, I think it's freeing. I think that it's, it's such a liberating concept to feel – to not have to feel like you're chained to whatever diagnosis uh, – has been given in your family and there's things that you can do to improve your health. And so speaking of improving our health and preparing for pregnancy, what are some of the ways that we can, we can do that as, as women and also our partners, I'll throw that in there. Cause I know you have a chapter yes. on, on <clears throat> men, which I loved, but what are some of the things that, that women can do then when we know we want to get pregnant and we want to try to prepare our bodies to the best right. of our abilities? So we, we do a lot of extensive um, 
layouts in the book, and I, I, we like to narrow it down just a little bit to maybe getting a food sensitivity test. Um, we find that that's very important to rule out. So even if it's a healthy food you might be sensitive to, you're not consistently aggravating your system. And then we look into the main foods to avoid and the main foods to add back in. So it's it's really not that complicated. We're trying to make it really palatable, really um, approachable, and easy to incorporate into one's lifestyle, so that you're not feeling like you're you know starving yourself or um, just doing some crazy cleanse. So the top things to avoid would be caffeine, alcohol, gluten, sugar, soy. And then change out those bath and beauty products. The stuff we're putting on and in our bodies daily um, can actually have quite an effect on us as well. They're called xenoestrogens. Mm -hmm. Well, and I I really like that section because um, I think that was the chapter that was called like detoxification. And so what I liked about that was you hear the word detoxification and you think, okay, so I'm going to go and like drink a ton of green juice and like (laughs) I'm going to do all this stuff to like get everything out of my body. And what I loved about the chapter was that it had nothing to do with that. It was like, actually stop putting these things in your body to take the load off. So maybe you could speak to that approach because um, that I did notice that I did notice that it was, it said detoxification, but the approach wasn't like, okay, so now you're going to do a 30 day cleanse and da da da. Living on <laughs> juice and you're not eating and yeah. <laughs> so why did you take that approach um, when you're talking about detoxification? Well, because again, we want it to be something that they can incorporate because we're making lifestyle changes, not short-term fad changes, um, which have great um, palliative help, but we're really looking for the long term because we want this to be sustainable for the rest of their lives so that they're also a model for their children and it's just what their household and how their household lives and eats. So when you avoid these um, main offenders, we'll call them, the things that can leach your um, body of nutrients and things that really need um, to help keep going hormonally and um, energetically. So caffeine and alcohol are kind of the common um, culprits and those are ones that everyone thinks about, okay, I need to stop those things when I'm pregnant. Um, But they're really great to stop preconception. Now, the, the ones that most people don't think about stopping when they're pregnant or beforehand are gluten and sugar. They're huge offenders. <laughs> they can really <laughs> aggravate. Gluten can cause serious inflammation, and sugar really is just like a drug. Um, it's addictive qualities, and it really spirals your, your body's chemistry out of whack in a, a major way throughout your day. Um, depending, most people, they can start their morning off with sugar. So it's just subtly finding ways to remove these offenders, and then we tell you how to put them in in a healthy way. It's sugar alternatives, caffeine alternatives, um, amazing ways to find breads or all those things that you fear are gluten in a healthy way. Um, and then the, the soy and the toxic bath and beauty products, uh, soy is in everything. You kind of just have to look for it, and it really can be proestrogenic and disrupt hormone levels. So um, as much as it's in everything, it's also really easy to remove from a diet. Mm -hmm. And the three soys that we really recommend are tempeh because it's fermented, tamari because it's fermented, which is a soy sauce alternative, and then miso, which is a wonderful nourishing electrolyte soup, um, but the real miso that comes in the paste. Again, it's fermented. So once you ferment it, you are taking care of all that proestrogenic property that comes from the soybean. Well, one of the things that occurred to me as I was going through the book, so it lays out what to do in each, you know, trimester, as you talked about. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we're only going to scratch the surface of it today. But it basically, it occurred to me that if a woman was having trouble conceiving, or because this podcast, I talk a lot about the fertility awareness method, and how you can actually see in your menstrual cycle, if you're charting, where different health issues or where you even have areas of suboptimal fertility. So it's like right there on your chart. So if a woman were to do all of these things, starting with the detox, so, you know, getting rid of the caffeine, sugar, alcohol, soy, gluten, um, xenoestrogens, I just wrote an article about how they mess up your hormones. And and then addition to the food and things that we'll talk about in, in in a while, if every woman that was having trouble conceiving did these things, 
obviously every single woman wouldn't just conceive the next day, but I think a significant percentage of women would have an increased chance. Like a significant yeah. percentage. It's it's significant. And then it's what you put back in. You don't take all those things out and then go eat, you know, it's like you don't go eat gluten free pretzels all day. <laughs> well, maybe speak a little bit to gluten. Um, so what, like just to why it's, so it's right in there, like detox, get rid of the gluten. And like you said, how soy is and everything, well, gluten, gluten is, is everywhere. Issue. And with, if you do a food sensitivity test, you might find that you don't have a sensitivity to gluten. And these are sensitivities. We're not talking celiacs with full-blown allergies. Um, so with Gluten, what we find, it's not the ancient wheat that we once ate. So we're not totally opposed to gluten. We're opposed to the modern genetically modified wheat that is in everything. So if you have fermented sourdough or sprouted spelt or any of the sprouted wheats um, or grains, those, if you can avoid them, is going to be really great for this 12-week detox. But there are alternatives such as what I just mentioned, like the fermented, the sprouted, um, things of that sort that are going to be okay. But I, we highly suggest too, if you're uncertain to get that food sensitivity test, because maybe it might be eggs that you're sensitive to where you never know. And is could. this for all women or is this, so these, is this for all women or is this for women who are having trouble conceiving or how? all women? Okay. So here's how we look at it, too, is we definitely focused our book on over 30 because that's when this biological clock starts to be um, really put in women's face, unfortunately. Like, we just wave the white flag to all of these terrible names, geriatric pregnancy, you know, maternal <laughs> pregnancy. Like, oh, my gosh, it's just awful. And we can be just as vibrant and healthy in our 30s as we were in our 20s or late teens. And when doing that, it's um, – it's for every person, whether you are going to have trouble conceiving, sometimes you don't know. So that's why we want women to do this anyway. It's much better to start off this way than try for six months and then realize you're having trouble and having to come back and follow this type of program. So basically by avoiding these things, we're taking off the, these, because food can be a, a stressor on your body. And so we're kind of alleviating those things. I mean, every time you, eat sugar, alcohol, like your body has to get rid of those things. It has to get rid of it. I was just reading somewhere. I think it's two glasses of wine and we're all for an enjoyable cocktail and celebration. Yeah. <laughs> not totally opposed, <laughs> but it's moderation and it's really realizing, look, you only get, um, we don't have that many babies. You know, we're not having 12 kids all the time. We usually have one, two, maybe three, four. And so when you can just say, okay, out of a whole lifetime of enjoying that cocktail, let's just stop for, you know, these couple years. It's totally worth it. Um, so a couple glasses of wine at night decreases your fertility hormones, I think by 70% in that evening or something like that. I was reading, I'll have to find it again, but it was... I believe alcohol has an estrogenic effect. So it kind of messes with, you mm -hmm. don't think that alcohol is messing with your hormones, but it actually does. And mm -hmm. I remember learning that when you drink alcohol, it like your liver it's like an emergency your body's like hey shut down everything we got to get the alcohol out so your liver stops getting detoxifying the rest of the whatever it's doing and the alcohol becomes a priority to get out of your system right which everything you're basically telling your body it's sick momentarily yeah so okay so we take out all of these things great and then what do we eat <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. We have a whole chapter on what you eat, what to put back in. There's plenty of options. So um, the things we like to throw back in are obviously quality, grass-fed, pastured meats, eggs, and dairy. Um, they're, the quality is really important of what you're putting in your system. They just have those studies coming out about beef, but they're not challenging grass-fed beef. They're just challenging regular conventional beef. Um, so it, it really comes back to quality. And bone broth, we love bone broth for all of its minerals, its collagen. It's just a, an amazing thing. This is the ancient stuff why chicken soup really does cure everything because chicken soup used to be made from the bones of the chicken, um, from the feet, from everything where all that amazing mineral content and collagen was there to help nourish that gut lining. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go back to, I don't think we really talked about this, but you have a whole thing like the, um, with the microbes in your gut and the gut is your biggest immune system. 
And so the whole reason, too, is why this is so important with food is when you remove the things that are damaging that immune system and putting back things that nourish that immune system, you are strengthening your entire body. So gut health is, for us, number one. Mm -hmm. Um, And these things that we're asking you to avoid really do get rid of those offenders that damage the gut, and we're putting back in things that are going to help heal it. Well, that's such an important point because the importance of gut health just it can't be understated. Right. It's it's getting a lot more attention, and we couldn't be more happy about it. Um, but yeah, we'll reiterate it all the time. We'll scream it from the rooftops. It's <laughs> it's importance. Um, and so yes, so the grass fed meats and dairy, the pastured meats and eggs, bone broth, leafy greens, dark leafy vegetables. Um, healthy fats and oils. This one I find really important with all my clients who are already pregnant. They're really going on a low fat diet and low fat is not the way to go. We're not in the eighties anymore. Um, we want lots of healthy fats and oils. So coconuts, oils, avocado, um, lots of nuts. Um, we have a list after list of healthy fats and oils and you don't want to remove them. You want to keep them in your in your diet. And then we have a section on thyroid boosting foods. So iodine, selenium, and where you can get them. Artichokes, um, asparagus, some delicious options just to throw in. And then we give a full 12 week um, way of a meal plan in the back of the book so that you don't have to create this from scratch. Mm -hmm. We offer grocery lists, the whole bit, um, so that you, you have either you can take from that or you can follow it recipe by recipe. Well, that helps it to not be as overwhelming because, because when you talk about these things, I think I was even having conversations with some girlfriends the other day and, and my one girlfriend was like, yeah, I want to lose some weight. And I said something about like eating healthy fats and she's like, yeah, but I don't want to actually think about what I have to make. I just want someone to tell me what to (laughs) to make so that I, (laughs) so that I could just do it and I don't have to think about it. And I was like, I just had a client say that I laid out every snack she should have for her, her lifestyle curtailed it for her lifestyle. She's a doula client and, um, she was loving it. She's like, thank you. I just needed someone to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, cause you get into habits and I've talked about this a lot too, with different guests about breakfast, for example, throw oh, breakfast gosh. under the, under the bus here, but breakfast is like a habit. So either if you don't have it, some people just don't eat it. Um, yeah. and then if you do eat it, you, pro- you know, what's the go-to. So a lot of people just have cereal or oatmeal or something like that. And like, that's mm-hmm. not o- ideal, but then to actually think about and making a new breakfast is just too much, <laughs> too much work. Right. Yeah. To- and that's our busiest time when we have kids or we're trying to get off to work and preparing. Um, what are we going to eat? What's fast? What's quick? And if you look at all the things that are usually fast and quick that we normally go to, they're prepackaged, they're pre-made, they're filled with sugar, and they set our metabolism off the wrong foot for the day. Mm-hmm. Well, and so maybe one of the things actually that I really like about the the dietary choices that are laid out in your book is that they really focus on nutrient density. So one of the things I've talked about is kind of that concept of food is fuel. So a lot of people think, you know, they just think of like, I'm hungry, I got to eat, I need energy, that's what I'm doing. But I love it when we shift the con- that conversation. And food is thought of as nutrition. And especially because of something you said earlier in the podcast that what we eat makes our baby. And I've said that so many times on the show. <laughs> Because you don't think of it that way. You just think of it as filling the void or feeling just like how you feel your car. But you are not a car. And the, <laughs> the nutrients that you bring in are what actually creates your baby. And like you said, has such a profound impact on the right. genetic expression of your child as well. Because food is, is information for your body. Exactly. No, that's beautiful. And I like that you did bring up the car because we have an analogy in there that you don't plan on a long journey or trip without getting an oil change or getting the clutter out of your car. You don't just add to it and take off and think you're going to have a safe journey. <clears throat> so why would we do the same getting ready to be pregnant for this nine month journey? <laughs> <laughs> we want to clean out the clutter and we want to make sure we're like got a fresh oil change and we're filled with good fuel, high <laughs> octane. Um, and doing so that's our food. Exactly. That is our fuel. And with the food, it's really quite incredible because we, again, it's that empowerment that we don't have to grab and go. 
So it is a little bit of forethought of preparing so that when you open up the fridge, when you're starving, you don't just snack or take the first thing you see or that's most available. You want to think, okay, what's going to, what's going to give me the sustainability? What's Mm going to really nourish me? Um, And that's what we really want to be teaching here within this book is what can you grab that is still fast? Oh, you baked a bunch of sweet potatoes. Grab that sweet potato. Eat that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and different snacks and different ways to nourish your body. And you'll realize you have sustaining energy. You have clearer mind and body um, in terms of your emotions, your brain activity, your clarity. You shouldn't feel like a brain fag um, or slowed down after you eat, which often we do shortly after we grab and go some, you know, filler or a snack. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, exactly right. We want to want to teach what what is fuel, so you get more bang out of your food at each meal. Especially as you're pregnant, you lose space in that belly. As you know, recently we were in the third trimester, that stomach <laughs> is smushed up near your throat. It feels like, and your eyes are bigger than your body in in terms of hunger. And you go and you eat for 10 minutes and you're full. So you've whatever you're going to eat in that 10 minutes better be good. (laughs) (laughs) It's just so true. (laughs) Yeah, eating constantly because your whole body changes. And I remember seeing this infographic when I did my prenatal classes with my first child. The second child didn't get the prenatal classes. (laughs) (laughs) But (laughs) but they like they had this thing where they they had this um, we cut the woman in half. They had this image of of her intestines. And you see how you're just at the end. They showed you the progression. You're like, where are her lungs? Where is her stomach? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Where where her where? Yeah. So it's exactly right what you're saying so what are some of the key vitamins and nutrients that we want to be getting before we even try to conceive to make sure that our body is replenished of these things so um the real thing i am that i learned actually from writing this book through krista is the difference between folate versus folic acid I think if you're talking about preconception, this one is huge because it could actually make or break your fertility. I'm sure you've had MTHFR talks on here before. Um, and I have that... just a couple, well, at the time of recording, just a couple of weeks ago. but Okay, perfect. So it's, um, it's a genetic mutation and it's actually, it's a problem with the ability to um, absorb the folic acid. Now, just a real quick thing is someone who might be having chronic miscarriages should get tested for MTHFR. We have this laid out in the book why um, Chris has had a lot of clients. They go and get tested and they switch from folic acid to folate, which is from a synthetic version to a food-based version. So the food-based version, folate, is easily absorbed in the small intestine. The folic acid, which is the synthetic version, sometimes is not absorbed at all if you have this gene uh, mutation and therefore you're not going to be able to carry through. So for fertility, um, with all these things, if you're talking about nutrients, I would consider folate versus folic acid. Look at that prenatal. um, Make sure you're eating lots of dark leafy greens, asparagus, and um, start with that so that you know your body. And this goes for men too. They can have that same genetic mutation. Um, and, and really start there and make sure you're getting the right food-based version. And then after that, it's really lots of um, basics. We want to keep it simple. It's the good proteins. It's the good fats. Um, it's the good mineral balance. So we want lots of pink Himalayan sea salt or Celtic salt that matches our mineral balance and hydration. Um, and, and keep it simple during that preconception phase into uh, pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Because with supplements, um, if you follow what we have laid out, you can curtail it. Fish oil, so that's another high fat we really encourage. Um, the, I, I, I'm just trying to keep it simple here so it's palatable for listeners. Yeah, because in the book it's a lot it, of information. It can be really <laughs> overwhelming and we really like to narrow it down because we also tell in the book, we're like, pick three things and start there. Yeah. Give it a couple weeks, pick three more. Slowly incorporate and see how it works and what works for you. It's not all going to work for everyone, but we're hoping what they do take from it is going to be that make or break in their um, – their vibrancy and their fertility and their pregnancy. Well, one of the things I liked about how you laid out the book was that in each section, 
there was a ton of information, but it, it was summarized either in the beginning or the end or both where it was kind of like, so these three, like, so a section mm-hmm. would be this, this, you know, in the first trimester, you, d- you need to do these six things or, or whatever. So um, obviously right. I don't have the book open at this exact second. So I don't, there's six things specifically, but it listed it very clearly. And so as you're reading the book, it's very like, okay, so if I don't have the emotional energy right now to actually digest every piece of information about every nutrient and why it's important Mm -hmm. I can actually look and see that these are the ones that are important and like you said pick three and start there and I love that about the book because oh thank you yeah (laughs) because it 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 kind of gets to both people it gets to like the super nerd that needs to know the why of everything and then the person that's just like look just tell me what I need to do and I will do it exactly and and let's put it this way um very few of us sustain that super nerd quality when we're pregnant. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need it as laid out, as simple as possible. There's a lot happening already. And then you add um, just general pregnancy, everything. And uh, yeah, we want to make it as palatable as possible. <laughs> well, pick out a couple of things that stood out for me. One of the things that I thought was super interesting and awesome was that in when you talked about you know, the, there was a section called the top six superfoods and you laid out some of the foods that are most nutrient dense and um, have the beneficial proteins, fats and everything for pregnancy. And one of the things you talked about was raw dairy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought that was a really interesting discussion. So maybe you could talk a little bit about your discussion of raw dairy and why you would actually recommend it for women who are um, either pregnant already or are planning to be pregnant at some point. Sure. This is a tough, um, controversial piece, and we definitely laid it out so that it's um, every woman making the most informed decision for themselves um, because there are so many serious complications with unclean dairy. Um, And the reason I say unclean is having met the owner of Organic Pastures, both Krista and I were at one of his talks, and his wife is a um, labor and delivery nurse. We got to speak uh, really about um, and learn the the differences of why raw dairy has so many benefits um, that could potentially be something someone definitely in preconception phase would want to incorporate. And if they're not willing to incorporate, why they would want to ditch the regular pasteurized dairy. Um, Because that's the main thing, is whether you're going to switch to the raw dairy or not, let's just get rid of the pastured dairy, because it's not serving you. Pasteurized (laughs) dairy. Pasteurized dairy, not pastured, thank you. (laughs) I'm looking at one of my notes right now. Um, And that's really the the point we want to get to, is is really information. Raw dairy has such a bad rap, because decades, millennia ago, really, it feels like, is that's all it was, was raw dairy. That's what everyone had, was raw milk. Um, And the farmers who kept clean pastures, which were challenging to do, got snuffed out basically by the ones who started pasteurizing their milk. And they essentially didn't have to keep a clean farm. They could feed them whatever they wanted. They could live in whatever conditions that kept them on a cheaper overhead. And they knew they would just go and boil it away. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's unfortunate. I mean, that's not a way I want food to be created. Just knowing that they can kind of make it as dirty as they want and they know they're just going to boil it away, um, and take away all the good enzymes along with it and the good bacteria. And so it's the pasture, pasteurized milk that we're, um, kind of really wanting to point out. And then everyone talks about being lactose intolerant, but often they're just pasteurized dairy intolerant. So it's the um, pasteurization that removes a lot of those enzymes that help process the dairy um, are no longer in there, so they can't process it. But if they actually drank raw dairy, you'd see a difference. And they've actually done studies on diabetic mice, given them the raw dairy, and it's eradicated it. Wow. Yeah. No, one of the things that stood out, (laughs) one of the things that stood out, um, was just that whole concept of like, when you pasteurize it, it doesn't matter what you do to the cow, like you, the cow yeah. could be totally sick and, and could have a ton of uh, pa- pathogens, pathogens, parasites, you name and it. And you just boil it and it's, yeah, that's so g- gross. 
And <laughs> I just, it's it's super, right? super scientific right. terms, but come on, it's just gross. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously for, if, if this is, and that's what I find super interesting because, you know, I grew up in the 80s, I'm an 80s baby. And so, yeah, it was always pasteurization, raw milk is dangerous. And you just, I, I had actually never even tasted raw milk until very recently that I found a farmer in my area. And now I have access to raw milk and I'm really excited about it. But one of the things that's really different is that, so I actually drive to the farm and, you know, the mm -hmm. farmers show me where, so it's very, it's a very different experience. You're really, because you, yeah, you, and if you're drinking raw milk, you actually have to know and understand where your milk comes from. And it's you really have to source it from somebody who is taking excellent care of their animals. The animals have to be pastured. They have to be eating what they're supposed to be eating. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the milk that they are producing then is actually has way more nutrient. It's it's not pasteurized. It's not homogenized. The homogenization process screws with the the fat molecules and every right. yeah. And then they take off half the fat so that you, you oh, know. I was a blue milk drinker in the eighties. I drank that non-fat blue stuff that everyone couldn't stand. <laughs> <laughs> so if a, yeah, I know. I remember when my parents switched to skim milk and I couldn't drink it because it just it tasted absolutely hor horrific. Yeah. But so let's, I guess, not to go on and on about raw milk too much, but when, a per, when you're drinking raw milk, if you're getting it from the farmer, it's like cow to table is basically right. what we're talking about here. <laughs> it is. It is. And so, you know, and that comes with all the fat. So then if you let it sit in the fridge, like the fat actually, you know, floats to the top. So why right. is that important? And won't that fat make me fat? And shouldn't I be drinking skim milk? Oh, goodness. Yes. We love the fat will make me fat story. Um, that is a very common misconception. It's been, gosh, it's been going on since the 80s, really, where it was all fat free, fat free, fat free. Let's do fat free. Um, so no, it's not going to make you fat. Healthy fats do not make people fat. It's sugar and carbs that make us fat because they hold on, wrap around and seal those fat cells, essentially. Right. Um, Fat does not do that. <laughs> fat process is through. It's good for our brain. It's amazing for our brain. Um, so. <clears throat> and the we, baby's brain. But even more than, yeah, the baby's brain is very important with fat. We talk about that. That's why fish oil, essentially, for a fatty omega-3 fatty acid, um, actually helps the brain develop and increases IQ if you are taking fatty or omega-3 fatty acids in your first trimester. But in terms of the raw milk, it's not even just the, the fat. It's actually um, the good bacteria. So when you're killing off all that bacteria in the pasteurization process, you're, you're killing the good and, yes, the bad. Um, and that's another one of the main proponents of why raw milk is so great, for all that beneficial bacteria. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're covered in bacteria and we don't want to lose all of the bacteria as well as those enzymes, the lactase that helps us digest it properly. So when you get rid of all that, you're basically just having some, a white drink. <laughs> you're not, <laughs> um, you're not going to be able without those enzymes to absorb all the nutrients from our food. And then you end up with deficiencies and digestive problems in the future. Mm -hmm. So raw dairy has a really great benefit because all those enzymes within it not just help process the raw milk, but help us process lots of food that we eat. Yeah, it's so interesting because one of my first guests on the show was Sally Fallon, episode nine, I think, from Weston, mm -hmm. the Weston Price Foundation. And oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So in that episode, she talked about raw raw dairy as well, and it's. Basically, it's just a totally different food. So I think it's really interesting to talk about that. And one of the one of the other um, things that you mentioned in the book that I, I thought I thought was really interesting because I had never really seen it put that way before was about protein. And mm -hmm. when you talked about protein, you were talking about how you, you want to eat protein every couple hours, every two to three hours. You talked about how it could reduce morning sickness as well mm -hmm. as something else that you said, which was that your body doesn't store protein so you need kind of a steady supply of it which I thought was really interesting right um 
yeah, protein is part of the, like, I call it the pregnancy triad. So you've got salt, water, and protein. Hydration, your electrolyte balance with the salt and the minerals, and protein. If you're lacking one of those, you're probably having symptoms. Um, one last thing on the raw milk, it provides the, that I realized the perfect ratio of protein, carbohydrates, and fat, one to one. And that helps feed the thyroid um, by turning off the stress response. So it, um, it can also help with restful sleep. So if you're going to drink it in preconception or during pregnancy at night, it's a great way we recommend to have it so you can get a nice restful sleep. So it helps with that master gland, the, not master, but that's the pituitary, but our favorite gland, the thyroid, which is in charge of so many hormones in preconception. So protein, it's, um, no, we don't store protein, which is why a lot of people, um, don't realize when they have that big protein meal that gives them sustained energy because as we're metabolizing it, that's what's giving us our energy because it also metabolizes a lot slower um, than some of the other things like the fast boost of a carbohydrate which turns into a sugar or something of the sort. So protein are literally the building blocks of what we're made of. So if to not have protein in our diet um, during pregnancy is really just removing building materials for baby. And then depleting mom from all of her own building materials because baby takes what baby needs. Um, so if it's not extra there for baby, then it's going to leach it from mom, mm -hmm. leaving her more depleted. Yeah, I think that's so important. And just that that's why it's so important that we kind of transition that thinking from food as fuel to food as nutrition and food as mm -hmm. information and and to address those minerals and vitamins and nutrients that we need when we're building a baby, because like you said, at the end of the day, the baby will take it. I mean, if there's not enough there, then the baby may have some deficiencies, but Correct. mom definitely will have deficiencies <laughs> if, mm -hmm. if we don't have enough. 100%. Yes. And that can make it difficult after the baby's born to recover from, from that. So maybe we can switch gears a little bit and talk about the whole, just the reality that most women now in our, you know, industrialized North American societies are having babies in their 30s. Uh, so having at quote unquote, the advanced maternal age. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of, I guess, maybe we could talk about some of the, some of the myths and some of the truths about ha trying, starting, uh, having our very first baby when we're in our 30s. Right. So sometimes the, um, the biggest one is, will I be able to get pregnant naturally? I mean, literally there's enough unfortunate media or stories out there that are claiming how hard it is and all the things, da, 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 once you reach that advanced maternal age, quote unquote, um, that it gets into our mental and emotional realm and sphere that makes us question um, maybe I won't be able to conceive naturally. And I think that's a, a very big one. Um, a lot of times what I think with, you know, maybe we've put career first, maybe we just haven't met the right person, or maybe it just hasn't happened. There's a million reasons why we may not have started our families um, at 22 or something of that, that age. So the I won't be able to conceive naturally is a myth. I think there is a lot of information and there's a lot of tools out there that women can um, take charge of and do and eliminate that myth and completely conceive naturally. We've got our, we call them our mama stories, which are moms that are over 35 up to 41 getting pregnant and <laughs> <laughs> are conceiving naturally. Um, and then we don't want to take away that intervention either. So at some point, maybe you've done everything. Maybe you've tried everything. Who knows what it is? And maybe IUI or IVF are your options. You still want to prepare your body for that. That's a very emotional and stressful experience. And financially, um, it's, not, it's not a cheap way to go. So if you prepare your body then for IUI or IVF, you're likely going to have a much better outcome and a faster outcome. So there's multiple reasons that maybe this natural way is just not um, available 
And it's still, we want women to know that they can still prepare their body and help create that healthy being. Um, the birth defects, you hear that. That's why they have the amniocentesis um, if you're over 35, which I consider Pandora's box because often they're wrong. So um, in terms of birth defects, I just want to say one thing. If you are getting an amniocentesis, please consider what you're going to do with the information. Because often what that information does is just completely stress a woman out in her pregnancy. And stress is going to be a huge um, factor for an unhealthy pregnancy because your whole system is now on its sympathetic nervous system heightened um, and that's going to affect you and baby. So whenever you're getting any of these tests to find anything out, please consider what you're going to do with that information. I think that is the most important thing. Getting the information is one thing, but what are you going to do with the information I think is really what people forget to really understand because it may change their mind of whether they get certain tests. So if your baby is going to have higher birth defects. Now, this was new to me. I did not know this. But this is true for chromosomal defects. Um, Down syndrome <clears throat> is one of those. Now, that is something that um, I, I just don't know that we have a lot of control over. Maybe it's something that a person's supposed to experience. I'm not sure. That would be a whole other topic. But what I did not know, which is kind of amazing is that the statistics are actually quite low. It's um, after 40, there's a 1% chance of that happening with a chromosomal defect. And after 45, it's only a three, less than three and a half percent chance. That's pretty low. If someone told me 1% or three and a half percent chance, I think I have a better chance of walking out and getting hit by a car in my front. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, so we want to get, we're trying to bust the myth of the fear because everything is so fear-based in pregnancy. There's so many things around fear that we want to eliminate that and come back to like, let's really look at the numbers here. It's a three and a half percent if you're over 45, a one percent if you're over 40. And then when you look at actually the statistics of um, the abnormalities for Chromosomal abnormalities, like we said, that's quite low. But then if you can look at congenital birth defects, they actually get better as you get older. The chances of having a congenital birth defect, meaning if they have um, a problem with their organs, such as the heart, brain, or lungs, there's no correlation in age increase at all. Mm. And I did not know that until we started writing this book. And that was amazing. Well, I think one of the, that is amazing. And I love that it's demystifying all of those myths. I think that fear piece really just, it, it changes the dynamic of this whole pregnancy thing. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've talked about this so much on the podcast because, you know, when a woman is coming off or when a woman wants to get pregnant, that's when she thinks, okay, I want to come off, you know, hormonal birth control mm -hmm. typically. Mm -hmm. And that's often when women find fertility awareness because then they're like, well, I, I need to know how the plumbing works. How, 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 how do I get pregnant? And that leads them often <clears throat> to learning about fertility awareness. And what I think is happening is that we're so afraid of getting pregnant. So fear is, is, is there mm -hmm. already. And we're told mm -hmm. that we can get pregnant any day, which isn't true because there's only a window, a small window. It's a very short window. <laughs> so we start on the train, the fear train already. And then we come off of the pill and we're so scared of getting pregnant. We have been for however many years we've been on the pill. So then it's like, as soon as you get off the pill, you think, okay, I'm going to get pregnant immediately. So you don't come off the pill until like the day before you want to start trying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the pill is a xenoestrogen in and of itself in the mm -hmm. sense that it disrupts your endocrine system, which is its job, and that's why it works. So you've been taking this and endocrine disrupting hormone all these years, and you've potentially been living your life. So drinking and mm -hmm. caffeine and eating junk, and we all do, right? This is life. Mm -hmm. So you've been eating junk and whatever your whole <laughs> life, potentially, right? Um, putting all these additional stressors on your body. And so then you start trying with this belief that you're going to get pregnant immediately. Right. And it doesn't happen within two months. You freak out, you know, and you go to the doctor. The doctor isn't telling you any of this information about how to improve your health and increase your nutrient stores and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
a year goes by and then straight to IVF because you're not getting pregnant. And so nowhere in this crazy fear train stuff are we taking a minute and actually being present and cognizant of the fact that we need to be really conscious that maybe our bodies are not exactly ready and we're waiting until we're older. Right. So if we just stopped and took, you know what I mean? Like stop with the fear based thinking and just kind of took a moment and really thought about like conscious pregnancy. Like how can I really prepare my body? And maybe I should wait six months to a year after all of this abuse that I've been putting my body through (laughs) to really actually physically and emotionally prepare to bring a life into the world. Wouldn't the world be different if we thought of it like that? It really would. We call it conscious conception because I read somewhere and it was beautiful. It's like, could you imagine if every baby was truly thought of and well um, prepared for and wanted as much as this kind of preparation because that's what we're doing we're starting to parent the second we decide at some point we're gonna conceive yeah and i i think it would be great yeah there's um real quick for statistics for those that are in their 30s so in their early 30s there's a 75 to 80 percent chance of getting pregnant within a year and in their early 40s there's a 65 percent chance of getting pregnant within that year without intervention and those odds really are in your favor when you start looking at that yeah. And then any, I mean, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, it's like this book presents so much information for women. And obviously to do every single thing would be a, a, a quite a challenge. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We just, there's so many different types of personalities out there. Some are going to resonate with one piece of it. Some are going to resonate with the other. So we just had to give every single bit we have. <laughs> but even for women to, to, to look through those things and like you said, pick three things or whatever in each stage and to do those things all it can do is improve your overall health improve your fertility improve your chances and improve the health of your your baby so i think uh i just love the way that that you laid out and i would definitely encourage listeners to check it out uh which i'll do as well um, before i let you go but i just wanted to ask a few questions i always ask a a couple kind of rapid fire questions to end the podcast today and so here goes what would you say is the most important thing that a woman should know when she's trying to get pregnant? That she has a lot more power internally than she realizes that what she might be hearing from externally. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. What would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you'd like to see corrected? Um, I think you mentioned it. I think it's that we get pregnant immediately. Some of us do. But still, if you look at statistics, it's four months. You have a 25% chance each month out of a four-month cycle. Um, and that give it, give it some time and some preparation. It's not, it's not immediate. And it shouldn't necessarily be immediate. Sometimes it is, but don't expect that. Okay. And last question of the day. Well, yeah, patience. <laughs> it's so hard, though, when you've been waiting so long and then, oh. you you know, okay, I'm ready now, but your body yeah. isn't. Yeah. Um, so for a woman listening who's currently on the pill, she doesn't mm-hmm. want to get pregnant right now, but she's thinking about it within the next two to three years. What advice, if any, would you give to her? Find that window when um, she's okay with being pregnant and get off the pill and start following our detox and our preconception plan. Um, the pill really doesn't show that we've found in research as much problems with getting pregnant. But what they found is depending on when you get off of it, is it may be harder if you are older to, um, it might be jump you into early menopause. So it might be harder for your hormones to rebalance out. So with the pill, don't just have a preconception plan, have a postpartum plan. Make sure you're following up with your hormone levels and really taking care of yourself afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love ending on that today. Well, Willow, thank you so much for being here today. I really enjoyed your conversation and I realized within five minutes that I could have talked to you for four hours. (laughs) (laughs) I know we're all over the place. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Well, the book is How to Conceive Naturally and Have a Healthy Pregnancy After 30. And 
you know, I really did enjoy the book and I found it to be super comprehensive. So if you enjoyed our conversation today, like I said, we only scratched the surface really of, of the information there. So if you're thinking about getting pregnant, you know, and you're not sure where to start and you wanting to make sure that you're preparing your body, this book is an excellent place to start. And I'm not just saying that I actually loved the book. <laughs> Thank you. Plug, so. plug, plug. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, I'm so excited for you. Congratulations on your newest. Oh, thank edition. you so much. And so Willow, how can our listeners find more out about you? Or if any of the listeners were inspired with our by our conversation today, how can they get in touch with you? Sure, they should definitely just go straight to howtoconceivenaturally.com. They'll find everything for the book, both me and Krista. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again, Willow. It was fantastic chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So head over to the show notes page and let me know what you found most helpful from today's show. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 61. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash fertility Fridays with an S and on Twitter at Fertile Friday. And if you enjoyed what you heard today, head over at, to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll be redirected to the Fertility Friday Fertility Awareness Facebook group. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. Of course, leave an honest review. I really appreciate you taking the time to let me know how I'm doing. And I'm super excited to be opening up my schedule to see clients in 2016. So I'm finally offering um, a basic introductory level fertility awareness course. So if you're wanting to learn more about the fertility awareness method, you want someone to guide you through the basics to help you with an introductory session, shoot me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com so that we can set up a free 15 minute consultation and we'll find out if we're a good fit to work together. Make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list so that you'll be the first to know when I release a new blog post or podcast episode. And if you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, just shoot me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. I do appreciate all of you for taking the time to tune into the podcast wherever you are in the world and whether you're on the go or you're commuting to work or whatever you're doing. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.